Thanks, music team. Excellent, excellent job. Just love the music. Um, sometimes when you, you, you're um, going to preach, you feel like you're carrying a pile of plates. You're, done that, you're carrying a pile of plates and you think if someone bumps you, they're all going to fall on the ground and you're going to forget everything. And um, It's just nice to be able to come in and, and glorify God together and have him lift our hearts up and um, focus the preacher as well. Um, let's turn to Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3. This morning we're going to look at how God restores a priest. How God restores a priest. This is a passage that's kind of gripped my heart recently. And um, I just love it. And I think uh, it's, it's appropriate too to what we're studying in Mark. As we keep bumping into Israel there, as we keep bumping into the law there, as we keep bumping into the Pharisees there, it's good for us to get some more context on Israel. So Zechariah 3. We're going to do the whole passage uh, this morning. Let's read it together. So just to give you context, there's been an angel showing, uh, showing Zechariah around and talking to him. And this is the he that's spoken of in the first part here. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said... Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you so much that you've uh, revealed these things to us, that we can look at what you've shown us here and take tremendous courage, tremendous encouragement, tremendous joy in the, the love that you've shown to Israel. And Father, we pray that we would see that in our own lives. We would see that you are not a God who runs out of patience with the people that he's called. Father, please work in us this morning. Bless us as we look at your word together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So before jumping into chapter 3, we need a bit of historical content and some, uh, context, and some of this you'll already be familiar with. You know, of course, that Israel was chosen to be a priestly nation, a priestly nation. They were called to be his representatives, and so he gave them a land, and he gave them a capital city in Jerusalem. He gave them a glorious temple and he gave them a heroic king. And the idea was that they would shine out, that they would be different and that pagan nations would be attracted to that difference and they would come and see the one true God amongst the people of Israel. We see this in Exodus chapter 19. I'll just read it to you from verses 4 to 6. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people, peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." So this was God's desire for Israel. And he gave them all that they need, all that they needed to carry that, that out. And it, it lasted for a while. It lasted for a while. 
And the David and Solomon's reign, the kingdom was enlarged, the glorious temple was built. And to some degree, Israel followed God and honored him and became an example to the people around them. But after Solomon, the kingdom split in half. The kingdom split in half into the northern and southern kingdoms. The northern kingdom based around Samaria and the southern kingdom based around Jerusalem. The northern kingdom was a spiritual disaster from the start and it carried on pretty much unencumbered in that until the point where God said, I've had enough. And he was, they were taken away by the Assyrians and they were basically destroyed. The southern kingdom... Uh, around Jerusalem, had many spiritual high points, but even they eventually succumbed to widespread idolatry. And God disciplined them. He didn't destroy them. He disciplined them. He sent them into exile under Babylon. But even as he was sending them, he was giving beautiful prophecies under the prophet Isaiah, they will come back. He will bring them back. And he even mentioned the name, you might have heard a, a few weeks back, we saw this in one of the sermons that was preached, mentioned the name of Cyrus, who wasn't born yet who was going to be the king under whom they would be brought back. But he disciplined them. And they were away for 70 years, 70 years of exile. And then after that, God did what he always does, exactly what he said he would. He brought them back under a leader called uh, Zerubbabel. If you guys are familiar with the walk through the Bible and talk through the Bible series, they call him Zerubbabel. Um, But Zerubbabel, they have these memory tools they use on the way through. This happened in 538 BC, 538 BC. And what they came to was very different from what they expected. What they came to was very different from what they expected. They came back to hard work and they came back to opposition when they came back to the land. They came back to what the prophet calls the day of small things. You'll see that in chapter 4 of Zechariah. The nation was small smaller than it was before. The land was small, smaller than it was before. Even the temple uh, that was going to be built was small. From this point on, they were going to be a subservient kingdom, a subservient kingdom. And they were paying high taxes under Darius the Mede. So they were not the glorious Israel of days gone by. It's interesting. God forgave them, God brought them back, but he didn't bring them back to the same thing. They were not the glorious Israel of before. They'd forfeited so much of what God had given to them. So the exile wasn't the only consequence of their sin. They had to come back and build from scratch again in the face of tremendous opposition. And under these very trying circumstances, they fell into discouragement. And you know, it's so often the case when we, when we focus on our need, when we focus on the hard thing that we're going through, we neglect the Lord. And when we neglect the Lord, we just look after ourselves. And this is what these people had fallen into. They said, well, I guess we'll just do our own thing. I guess we'll just look after ourselves. And so 18 or 20 years after they came back under, under Zerubbabel, God brings two prophets into the scene. Two prophets. One was Haggai and one was Zechariah. And with Haggai, they got, you'll notice, it's a short book. They got an earthy, practical, concise kind of come on that he, that he spoke to these people. A godly Laken Hewitt, you might, want, you might want to say. Just come on. But with, with Zechariah, they got something very different. Zechariah is full of imagery and glory and futuristic prophecy. And you know what? God knows we need them both. Sometimes I need a Haggai to come along and tell me the next step. Just the practical next step I need to take. But so often we need more than that. We need to know what God has in store for us. And that is absolutely what what Israel needed at this point in time. They needed to hear God once again say, I have great plans for you. I'm not finished with you yet. And so in the first chapter... Of this book, and this is good context for us as we come into chapter 3. He says in verse 3, Return to me and I will return to you. Return to me and I will return to you. So, 
This, the, the interesting and difficult part about dealing with Zechariah is his time zones, what we like to call time zones. I keep finding that when I'm, in, when I'm traveling in Indonesia, I keep having to change my watch because when I go over to Java, it's, a, it's an hour this way, and I go into Maluku, it's an hour that way, and if I go to Papua, it's two hours that way. And you always have to keep changing your watch because you're in different time zones. And this is what we find interpretationally as we come to Zechariah. Is, is he talking about now? Is he talking about the Christ, Christ's coming? Is he talking about Christ's second coming? When is he talking about as we go through? And what, what we'll find as we go through this passage is, yes. <laughs> He's speaking about now. He has a message for them. He's speaking about later. He has a future message for them. He's speaking about much later. He has a far future message for them. And, and those are exciting, exciting things to see. Um, and so what we're going to find is the early, passage, early part of the passage, he's talking about very much their need right there. And as we get on past verse 8, he's talking about the future where Israel will find their true being in Christ. And what we'll also find is something very beautiful here, is that there's something that we can see in this about God. Something we can see in this about God. Sometimes it's hard for us to see the differences between, uh, sorry, the, the similarities between the old and new covenants. Because when God's talking to people in the old covenant, he's generally talking to the nation. He's talking of the priesthood. He's talking in uh, civil terms in many ways as well. Um, and so when we look at the new covenant, when he's talking about a spiritual body made up of individuals, it can seem like a big change. But in this beautiful passage where we see Israel pictured as one man, a man in filthy clothes, yet being purified and set apart for God, a picture that's just like someone else we know, right? Just like us. It makes us see that God's heart has never changed. His heart has never changed. And although much of the old covenant is like a cardboard cathedral waiting to be superseded, we can still see God fully in this. It's his. And it shows the representation of his character in that. So, so as not to interrupt the flow as we go through it, I want to talk through the whole passage in relation to Israel first so that we can see what God's doing in them. But then I want to come back. I want to come back and see how it applies to us, how we can see ourselves in God's beautiful way that he works in Israel here. So to start with, I want to introduce two characters, two key characters in this book. The first one is called Joshua. Joshua. And he's the high priest here. He's called Yeshua uh, or Jeshua in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. And he's mentioned, mentioned also in Zechariah and Haggai. Um, so he's very, very prominent. Very, very prominent. Now, it's quite possible that he was a seriously compromised high priest. That is possible. But most commentators I read to various degrees see him as representing Israel, representing Israel and their role as a kingdom of priests, as we just read. Uh, one of the classic Old Testament commentaries, Keelan Dalish, say this, The priesthood of Israel was concentrated in the high priest, just as the character of Israel as a holy nation was concentrated in the priesthood. The high priest represented the holiness and priestliness of Israel, and that not merely in certain official acts and functions, but so that as a particular Levite and Aaronite, and as, as the head for the time being of the house of Aaron, he represented in his own person that character of holiness and priestliness which had been graciously bestowed by God upon the nation of Israel. So as we go through this, We'll be speaking of Israel rather than Joshua most of the time, seeing him as representative of God's work in Israel. The second key person that might have pricked your attention as we were reading through it is an enigmatic character that we see popping up through the Old Testament called the Angel of the Lord. The Angel of the Lord. He's spoken of six times in Zechariah, and three of those times are right here in chapter 3. Now, one key feature about this mysterious angel is that he speaks with the voice of Yahweh. He speaks with the voice of Yahweh. We see this in the burning bush narrative in Exodus 3. 
and in Gideon's call in Judges 6. And we see it wonderfully here in this passage where in verse 4 he says, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away. So this has most, led most uh, commentators to conclude that the angel of the Lord is at very least divine, if not the pre-incarnate Christ. So you'll find as you, you read the, the commentaries on this one, most people will be saying he's at least divine and many will be saying he's the pre-incarnate Christ. So we're going to walk through this passage together. Um, and for a bit of clarity, I'm going to give it six headings. <laughs> Just when you thought you liked me. Six-point sermon. <laughs> and this is six Ds. Six Ds. A devil, a defender, a dilemma, a deliverance, a duty, and a day. We'll see those more as we go through, and it's not necessary for you to memorize them. <laughs> Let's look at the first one. A devil. Verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Standing before the Lord was a term often used um, in a technical sense of carrying out the priestly role. Carrying out the priestly role. And what's interesting here is that Joshua is doing it before whom? Before the angel of the Lord. He's divine. So the picture is Joshua representing Israel as a nation of priests and he's seeking to perform his priestly duties. Well, the accuser appears. The accuser appears. And he comes to stand where accusers were supposed to stand, at his right hand, to accuse. And so the priestly scene becomes a courtroom scene. The word Satan here could as easily be translated accuse, accuser, so speaking of someone else who had come to accuse. But the scene and the way that God handles it removes any doubt that this is talking about Satan himself. Satan himself. The accusation that he brings is about Israel's sin. Israel's sin, that's very clear. And what's interesting, of course, is that we know Satan's a liar, right? We know he's a liar. But did he, did he have to tell any lies about Israel's sin? Did he have to make it look worse than it already was? No. No. Their sin was obvious. Their sin was obvious. And Satan, in his, in his wicked way, was saying, surely they've gone too far now. How can you continue to love this worthless people? Haven't they embarrassed you enough? And you know what? The stakes were high here. The stakes were high. What happens if God destroys Israel? What happens if he destroys them at this point? No Messiah. No redemption. Hundreds of promises broken. The stakes were high. And this is Satan. He's, he exists to thwart God's plans and to tear down God's people. And you know what? He's more than a match for us frail humans. He is. But he's not a match for God. That's a mismatch. Let's look at the next point, the defender. Verse 2. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? This is, this is a neat thing to see. God only ever has to speak to subdue Satan. You notice Satan disappears after that? He's gone. And all God had to do was speak. Like I said, it's a mismatch. And you know what? God doesn't attack back. You see that? He doesn't use attacking words. He doesn't put on the Gandalf voice. Trusting that most of you have seen that film. He <laughs> doesn't need to raise his voice and speak with authority. He just speaks clearly. He speaks clearly. Interesting, he uses the same words that Jude encourages Christians to use. The Lord rebuke you. God doesn't defend himself. He doesn't defend his choice of Israel. He simply reminds Satan of a couple of truths, two decisions that he had made concerning Israel, and that settles it. And the first one was that he has chosen Jerusalem. Now you notice that he's talking to a nation here. Have I not chosen Jerusalem? And he chose them, he did. And he chose them utterly of grace. 
And even in the deepest valleys of their sin, he was never going to discard them finally, never. This is speaking nationally, of course. He destroyed plenty of sinful Israelites along the way. They had brought a huge reproach on his name, yet he never gives up on them. He doesn't. I often think about this. We, we make much of Christ's love for the church, and we should, always. But please don't let us forget God's love for Israel. God's love for Israel is stunning, and it's faithful, and it's enduring, and it should be something that moves us and teaches us. It's a beautiful thing. And even though he knew that they were only going to finally uh, become who they were supposed to be in Christ, he never removes his love from them. God doesn't apologize for that. God doesn't justify himself about that. He just says, I love them. And that's that. The second truth that God lays out is the familiar words, uh, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Amos also uses this terminology. It speaks of grabbing a burning stick out of the fire. Grabbing a burning stick out of the fire. You know what? A number of saints have used this over time, speaking of themselves um, as being saved by God, plucked from hell. John Wesley is probably the most famous when he spoke of the time when he was a child and his house was on fire and he got stuck in the house and someone had to get out and pluck him out of that house. And he always spoke of himself as a brand plucked from the burning. And so this is where he got that from. Here, of course, it's most likely speaking of their being plucked out of captivity, saved out of captivity. Captivity didn't usually go well for a nation. It would usually destroy a nation, utterly destroy it or disperse it. But out of the many sticks in the fire, God plucked one out, a remnant, that he brought back, still smoking, saying what? I still have plans for you. I still have plans for you. So God defended them. Now in this passage, what's also clear is he did not defend them because they were lovable. He did not defend them because they were lovable. Let's go on to verse 3. This is their dilemma. <clears throat> Couldn't find a C word that starts with a sin word that starts with D. Incidentally, the sin word in Indonesian starts with D, dosa. Verse 3, now Joshua was standing before the Lord, clothed with filthy garments. So you see he's standing before the angel of the Lord again. So this picture has gone back to his priestly duties. Yet instead of wearing the glorious, beautiful robes of the high priest uh, that, that showed what dignity that role had, he was wearing filthy clothes. The word used for filthy here is the revolting kind of filthy. It usually spoke of something stained by vomit or excrement. So real filthy. It wasn't just someone with a stain. Super filthy clothes. And you'll notice in verse 4 that these clothes are a picture of his sin. And like I said before, their sin is undeniable. It's undeniable, but this picture is graphic. Someone you don't want to be in the same room with. Someone you, you don't want to be in the same car with. And you know what? That's exactly how God sees sin. He sees it as utterly vile. Utterly vile. And God uses graphic language to describe sin in the Bible because really we don't get it. We don't understand. We're used to it. We live in our world and our hearts become dull to what sin is around us. And so God uses uh, these descriptors to make us realize how he sees it. There are some times when God gives us a glimpse of his holiness and when our sin shocks us to the core, you realize what you're wearing. But in many cases, the appalling nature of sin doesn't really hit us. It doesn't hit us. And you know what? This picture becomes more shocking when we realize that this person was a priest. This person was supposed to be ministering for God. This person was supposed to be an example. This person was supposed to be wearing the beautiful clothes that they'd been given for that role, and yet he'd, he'd allowed himself to be covered in filth, in filth. So this is not talking about the toddler who gets himself covered in filth and you, you go and hose him down. It's not talking about the youth group kids who have a cow, a cow pat fight, you know, and I can picture some of you doing that, <laughs> where you just kind of giggle about it. 
This is a grown man who knows better. Someone who is supposed to be an example, someone who is supposed to be pure, and yet he's gone and rolled in the filth. That's a sad, sad thing. And you know, so often with sin, we, we think of our categories. Well, you know, that's kind of worse than that, and that's kind of better than that. You know, those are unhelpful things to think about. There are consequences of sin on our earth, and I suppose some of those things have categories, but before God, it's all about your heart and your attitude towards him. I mean, what's a piece of fruit, really? When you think about Genesis chapter 3, what's in a piece of fruit? The only thing, there was nothing inherently evil about that piece of fruit except that God says you can have any other piece of fruit. Make a fruit salad, go for it. All I want is for you to not touch this one. And their sin was appalling because for all that they could have, Adam and Eve both said, no, I'm going to take that one. That's sin. That's the heart of sin where I say to God, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you say. This is the scary thing. Sin provokes God to disgust and it provokes him to anger and we need to see it clearly. So looking at this filthy nation, these people that had come so close to destruction that God saw them like a smoking stick, what's God going to do? What's God going to do? Well, what he does here is he shocks us with grace. He shocks us with grace. And you know what? Grace should shock us. It should shock us. If grace doesn't shock us, we haven't understood what sin is. We haven't understood how revolting it is. We haven't ad- understood the extent to which it provokes him. So grace should shock us, and it does here. Let's look in verse 4 as we see a deliverance. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your sin away, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, this is really interesting, who's I? This is Zechariah. He gets so excited, he pipes up. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. We'll look at that in a sec. So they put a clean turban on his head, clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. Um, The further you look down this passage, the further it jumps into the future. But, But I struggled to see this particular aspect as in the future just yet. The reason being that that Zechariah has promised them that if you will return to me, or God has promised them, if you will return to me, I will return to you. And so he has something to say to this discouraged people at this point in time, these people who have gone after themselves. And so that's what we're looking at here, where they're saying, is God even with us? You know, we're looking at the fact that we're back. Um, You've brought us back to our land, but we look around us and we think, are you just fulfilling your promise, but your heart's not in it? You done that before where you've, you've committed to do something and by the time you get around to it, your heart's not in it and you just have to do it purely out of faithfulness? Can you imagine these people thinking that? Thinking it's just not what we thought. Are you just fulfilling the minimum of your promise and your heart's not in it because of our sin? And yet, no, that's not the case. God shocks them. God shocks them. So what would you say as you're seeing these people having their filthy clothes removed, representing sin, what would you call that in your current understanding? That their their sins were removed. We call that something starting with F, don't we? Forgiveness, right? It was taken away from them. That's beautiful. So that was forgiveness. Sorry, I just jumped down to the wrong spot there. (laughs) But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just remove the clothes. He commands that new, pure, beautiful garments be put on Joshua. And again, this is where Zechariah pipes up. You see him there? Don't forget the turban. Don't forget the turban. As if God was going to forget the turban. He interrupts him. You know why this is? Zechariah was a priest. He was from the priestly family. And he could see what God was doing. He could see that these were priestly robes. He could see that they were priestly robes that he was putting back on. And he says, don't forget the turban. 
You might remember that the turban had a plaque on it that said, Holy to the Lord, pure and set apart for him. And so the removal of the soiled clothes represented forgiveness. With your New Testament understanding, and this is not the New Testament, so don't think I'm twisting it that way. With your New Testament understanding, how would you see the fact that the forgiveness happens, but then he gets brand new clothes and a new commission? What do you see that as described by a New Testament word? Someone saying justification? Isn't that amazing? Seeing the similarity of God's character and his heart and his desire and how he deals with sin-stained people in the Old Testament too, to some degree. True justification it only happens through Christ. But we can see God's heart here. Um, yeah. What we need to focus on here is the riches of God's grace to these people. And this brings us to something else. Something, again, that's clearly taught in the New Testament. Let's look in uh, verse 6 at their duty. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. This is interesting. With a new gracious commission came a call back to their role as the priestly nation, spelled out in terms of the actual priesthood. They were totally forgiven. They were totally forgiven. They were standing there in beautiful, shining, bright clothes, but they were not free to do what they wanted. They were not free to do what they wanted, either in their life or in their ministry. And this is what we see in the if-then construction. Can you see it here? If you will walk in my ways, then you will become. If you will walk in my ways, he refers to wholehearted obedience to their God. Wholehearted obedience to their God. Keep my charge, as we go further down. This refers to carrying out their priestly duties as the Lord had set out. It was his charge. It was his charge to them. And if they did this, well, then he would, they would be given responsibility over the temple and over the courts and have access to God himself. So ruling over the temple is, is the running of the temple, which the priests did. Ruling over the courts was keeping the temple courts pure from anything idolatrous. You might remember Jesus doing this when the priests were failing a few hundred years later. Over the courts. And the last one here, look at this, right of access among those who are standing here. Who was standing here in the vision? We have the angel that brought Zechariah, was showing him around. We have the other angels, remember the ones that removed the clothes from them? And we have the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. They had access. They had access. And this is what brings us back to chapter 1 and says, where, where, where he says, return to me and I will return to you. I will return to you. When God said that, he wasn't lying. God forbid. He gave them a real promise and they could stand on it. Return to me and I will return to you. If they would repent, they would again have access to him as their God. Now, we're at the time where we're about to jump into the future. Think with me for a minute. God knows the future, right? I don't need to say that. He lays out the future. He gave Israel a fresh start. He gave them a chance. He promised that if they would return to him, he would return to them. But let me ask you, what, what else was going to happen after this? Could he say to them, everything's going to be great from now on? You guys are going to walk with me from now on? Was there greater sin behind them or in front of them at this point in time? Around 500 years before Christ. Was there greater sin behind them or in front of them? In front of them? They would never go back into idolatry again. Not the kind of idolatry they committed at that time, but they were going to kill the Son of God. They were going to kill the Son of God. 
And so when God wanted to give them hope, he, he jumped way into the future. He jumped way into the future because these people were going to throw off his authority again and do something horrific. So when God's going to give them real encouragement, solid encouragement, he had to do it way in the future. Let's look at verse 8 here. A day. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. So Joshua and his friends are undoubtedly priests. Priests. What were they a sign of? What was it that these priests were foreshadowing that was related to this branch who was Messiah? That'd be the great high priest, wouldn't it? The great high priest. And God reminds them that he's coming. The Messiah here, he's spoken of as the branch, which was Jeremiah's and to some extent Isaiah's language. And this is familiar language to them. And you remember the threefold office of Christ? This Messiah was going to be the divine prophet, the final authority as a king. And he was going to be the ultimate priest. He was going to lay down his life as an all-sufficient sacrifice. So on a single day, he would finally completely deal with Israel's sin. And you know what? It wasn't going to be in some impersonal animal sacrifice. He was going to pick up those filthy clothes and he was going to put them on himself and he was going to take the punishment that was deserved for those sins. This is our Christ. That's amazing. He did it himself. I think the stone here is most likely referring to the same Messiah. The eyes on the stone probably refer to his intelligence and all-knowingness and it may be the inscription is referring uh, to the fact that this was going to be the chief cornerstone the chief cornerstone, but, but really it's a mystery. It's a mystery, and we trust the Lord's going to make it clear. And rather than get bogged down in those mystical details, we don't want to miss the point that this is Jesus. This is Jesus, this branch, this cornerstone. He is their hope. He is their hope. One detail we don't want to miss, however, is the when. And that's really interesting in this passage, the when. Look down there again. And I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. So sitting under one's vine and fig tree was a Jewish metaphor for living in peace and prosperity. Peace and prosperity. Let me ask you, was that fulfilled in his first coming? Is that what we saw? Peace and prosperity and vines and fig trees? No, we didn't see that. The, the sacrifice was made and their sin was absolutely paid for, but they needed to respond. They needed to respond to that and they didn't. They rejected him. They rejected his atonement. They rejected him personally. And so it wasn't available to them at that point in time. So as we're speaking now, this is still future. This is still future. And Paul explains this in Romans chapter 11. And if you just flick with me over to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, I want you to see something there. This is a stunning passage. Stunning passage. Zechariah chapter 12. God speaking. Verse 10. Come on, it's only three pages. <laughs> God says, And I will pour out on the house of David and, I, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. It goes on to express uh, the great grief the whole nation will feel when they realize what they've done. And then in verse 1 of chapter 13, look, look there, we read, On that day 
there shall be a fountain opened, fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. This is, this is again stunning, stunning. There's a time that's still future when God will again draw their hearts to himself sovereignly. You see how he's going to do that in that passage there? But this time he's going to call them to the all-sufficient sacrifice, the everlasting high priest. Now just stop there for a second. Isn't God's love for Israel incredible? Isn't his love for Israel incredible? Thousands of years of rejecting him and he still says, I love you and I'm not giving up. Wow. That should encourage us, shouldn't it? God, are you patient enough for me? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. This is amazing. And this is beautiful for us to look at again as we see ourselves here and we see uh, see, see Israel uh, pictured as one person. This reminds us of ourself. Reminds us of ourself. Let me ask you, is there still a devil? Has he changed? Has he changed? Does he accuse you? Remind you of your sin? Two and a half thousand years, he still wants to destroy God's plans and God has wonderful plans for you to shine for him, to love him, to joy in him, to rejoice in him. What happens when all you do is think about your sin? Just a moping believer. Because you're listening to his voice. You're listening to his voice. The devil's still around. Let me ask you, do you have a defender? Oh boy, you have a defender. You have a defender, this same God. And you know what's so special is that we saw that those promises to Israel were national, right? In the new covenant, they're personal. They're personal. Has God not chosen you? If you've put your faith in Christ, he's chosen you before the foundation of the world, fully knowing every sin, fully knowing every failure, fully knowing who you are. And he's made his promises to you. And he's your defender. He's your defender. Is he patient enough for you? Will he keep his promises to you? He will. Don't ever doubt him. Don't ever doubt him. You are his possession. You are his child. And no one can argue with that. Please, read Romans 8. Read Romans 8, because that's that's grounded and rooted in this truth about who God is. Beautiful thing to to realize that we have that defender. How about your dilemma? Your sin? For those of you who have believed, have you realized the depth of what your sin was to God? God? How, how utterly offensive that was to him. If you haven't understood that, then you don't understand grace right now. Your sin that you continue to commit at times, do you see how revolting that is in God's eyes? Do you see what you're saying to him in your heart when you refuse to obey his word, when you neglect his word? God sees that as filthy, as appalling, as provoking to him. Don't ever lessen your sin. Don't ever lessen it. This is a a terrible, terrible danger for those of us who have been Christians for a long time because we're just used to hearing it. This is a terrible, terrible danger for people that have grown up in a Christian home because they've heard these sermons since they were little and yawned their way through them and tried to stay quiet and tried not to annoy their brother through these sermons and yet they come in one ear and out the other. Please do not treat God's word that way. God does not understand sin. He will never understand sin. He will never wink at sin. He will never think sin is okay. Our sin is repulsive before God, and we need to understand that. And if we don't, we don't understand salvation. We don't understand his grace. This is very, very important for us to understand. He doesn't want to crush you with your sin. He wants to relieve you of your sin. He wants you to be honest about your sin. 
so that you can receive his forgiveness. God's idea in that is always good, his motivation. A deliverance is the next one. Are you standing here just looking at yourself thinking, I'm standing here in filthy clothes, who can help me? Well, there has been a deliverance made for you. There has been a deliverance made for you. Christ, he died for you. He took those filthy sins and he died for them in your place. And you know what? If, if you haven't come to know him yet, we would love to talk to you. You know what? Look around you. We're all like you. We might, we might look a bit spruced up, but we're people who are sinful at our heart and needed God's forgiveness desperately. And we want to talk to you about that because we'd encourage you to come to this Christ and feel that joy and know who he is. It's a beautiful thing. And he wants to give you new clothes. He doesn't want to take, just take off your old clothes and treat you like a dog. He wants to give you beautiful new clothes and a new commission. Holy to the Lord. This is our God. This is our beautiful God. Sometimes uh, we see ourselves as still wearing these filthy clothes as Christians. You know, it's good to be sensitive to sin. But to wander around miserable about your sin when you've been saved is not good. It's not good. Because you're denying what he's done for you. He delights in you. He loves you. Don't live like it's not true. Receive his grace. Focus on his grace. Second to last is a duty. A duty on Wednesday night. We talked briefly about the things that God saves us for, not just the things that God saves us from and who he saves us through, but the things that he saves us for. To show forth Christ, to serve Christ, to share Christ. Are you laying down your life? Are you carrying out your Christian duty for what he did for you? Or are you just coasting to the finish line? I had a guy call me this week, an older man, and he's just wanting to know our prayer points, wanting to pray for us. And you know what I thought? What a beautiful way to end your days, using that strength that you have left to serve him in the way that you can when your body's going. <laughs> you can still pray. Isn't that beautiful? He's called you to be his priest. Can people see that? Can people see that in your workplace? Or are you being drawn to the nature of the other peoples around you like Israel were? so that people can't see a difference anymore. God wants to do that in you as well. He's called you to be his priest. Be his priest. I'm not going to stretch talk about the day because the day that was talking about being talked about there is not actually the final day. It's a day that's already present for us where Christ would die for their sins and he has died for our sins. And that's fantastic, isn't it? Don't we have an amazing God? Let's, pr let's pray together. Dear Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we can see you in it. And although it's sometimes our, our human mouths bumble through things, Lord, help us to see what you're saying in this passage. Help us to see the beauty of your character. Help us to see the riches of your long-suffering and your grace. Help us to see the revoltingness of sin, Lord. Help us to be disgusted by it, Father. Help us to be convicted for it. And Father, let us see the riches of your grace and your loving kindness in Jesus Christ that raises us up and seats us with Christ in heavenly places that adopts us, that makes us beautiful when before we weren't. Father, help us to rejoice in these truths. And help us, Lord, to be your priests, we know we already are, but we want to look like it, Father. We don't want to be dressed in filthy clothes as your priest. We don't want to be so compromised in our life that people don't even know we're a Christian. Or they speak about us behind our backs, saying, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want to know it. Father, please, please convict our hearts that we may walk with you, that we may lay down our lives for you, that we may serve you as you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.